First up, we have Dominique Abort, who's going to talk to us about last chance strategies and data processing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So there is this famous saying that in theory there is no difference between theory and practice, but obviously in practice there is. So all the talks which you heard in the last day and today, there were plenty of nice examples, and those examples, you need them when you develop the software. But I happen to work mostly on the examples where software break. Actually, in Zbyszek's lab, I, I am, I would say, main program breaker. And I'm going to tell you basically how to go around various problems which don't fit to the framework of the, at least, data processing software. So, what is the main goal of the crystallography? <coughs> You're supposed to start from the data, and your main goal is to get to the beautiful model. Unfortunately, this is the type of the problem which is called inverse problem. Uh, and inverse problems in crystallography are pretty nasty problems. So, they are called, not only they are hierarchical, but also they are called ill-posed and ill-conditioned. And these two words, actually, each of them defines the whole field where people fight about the meaning of every word. So I'm not going to focus too much about, uh, on it. Just to, I'm going to tell you that it simply means that there is no guarantee of solution. So you can have perfect data and still no solution. Moreover, you can fail at various steps because each of the steps is the type of the inverse problem. And on top of it, we have lots of information, which I discuss later. However, what... <coughs> so, so, how to go around this problem? Pretty much why we do care at all. Because that was discussed really extensively. Uh, what we care about is information. This is signal to noise. However, what we measure in crystallography is intensity. And the uh, intensity by itself is not a phasing signal. Various types of methods rely on the differences between the intensities, and these differences are obviously much smaller than the measured intensity. In the same time, we have plenty of sources of the problem, starting from the random effects, which by definition are random. In the case of systematic effects, which I call them effects because... Uh, Sometimes you can correct them. They simply, uh, systematic means that there is some type of correlation, some type of pattern which you can get out. And you obviously have outliers. In case of outliers, this is, for example, ice. So, how bad is the problem? How bad is the problem? Uh, in case of data insufficiency in crystallography, we have three, actually we have two main methods, either molecular replacement, or some type of phasing technique. In molecular replacement, your signal is the intensity, so this is very forgiving technique. The systematic uh, error level for good experiment at synchrotron is about 3.5%. Your signal is somewhere here. However, in case of the standard selenium, MAD, MAD or SAD experiments, the signal from selenium is quite low because it's about 5% for average protein. So with 3.5% of error level, you are already at the edge. You really don't have room <laughs> for making mistakes. And you also see why the MAD experiment is sometimes, basically why it's not popular anymore. Because this person's differences for this average protein from selenium will be about 2%. So why people measure them at all? Because, which I don't, I don't discuss it here, there are correlations between various effects, and sometimes the uh, signal from uh, dispersive differences is anti-correlated with the, some systematic effect, so in fact you can use it, sometimes. So all the problems I divide for two groups, and I will discuss them uh, in this order, more or less. So you have difficulty, and difficulty pretty much is related either to the crystal properties or to the properties of the problem, facing problem, or sometimes you have, unfortunately, the mixture of both. So it's better to have large crystal than small crystal because crystal is actually multiplier. This is what diffracts. 
it's better to have good order instead of the bad order, high solvent instead of this low solvent because it helps you in phasing, and so on. I put NCS and crystal symmetry in the middle because depending on the situation, it helps you or it can hurt you. It's very good to have NCS symmetry and use it for phasing, but you have to identify it. And actually, the presence of NCS symmetry with a multiple copy may, for example, affect the heavy atom search. So pretty much, <coughs> these two help you at some stages of the process and may help you at other stages. So coming back to this uncertainty, what you can do, you can either ignore them completely, the elegant name for it is mask. You can try to correct or model them or eliminate the source. But all these three things depend on the fact that you have to identify the first. So the whole thing about the difficulty of inverse problem in crystallography is that very often you cannot solve the structure, but you don't know why, because there are so many reasons why things may go wrong. So we have two tools which we can use. One, it's called Darwin's, Darwin's equation. This is one of the versions of the equation which I use, but there are plenty of them. It describes how the measured intensity depends on the structure factor which we want to get. But pretty much we have a lot of other components here which affect the measured intensity. And they will tell you where the problem is. So, <coughs> how to approach the unsolvable structure. The first thing is that you are looking for the largest source of the problem. If you have 20 possible sources, there is really no point to try to solve something which contributes 1 or 2% to the problem. You are really have to go for the one which makes your life the most miserable. This is one tool. Another tool is that we have to actually identify, not only we want to analyze problems, but you know, we would like to see where it is. And in case of data processing, the tool number two is various types of goodness of fit uh, statistics. Here we see how the chi-square changes with resolution, and we see that chi-square, which is blue line here, has some issues at this uh, range, and these are serious problems. So goodness of fit simply analyzes how the given observation, how the given intensity agrees with symmetrically equivalent intensities under given model. So in inverse problems, which I didn't mention earlier, the most, par uh, the most important part of the inversion is how good is your model. And all processing programs have actually very good models at this point. However, they are obviously working for the, even if they work robustly, there is always Structure, it will be your structure, which may not agree with the assumptions in the program. Another point, because I spent so much time on inverse problems, how to understand the inverse problem better. Actually, if you have problem with understanding it, you may think about what forward problem is. So forward problems, everybody here use strategy or simulation. These are problems where you always get solution. It may not be great, but you know if you put something in the program, there will be outcome. So simulation, <coughs> strategy calculation programs, these are forward problems. They are by definition much easier than any type of inversion. So once again, how to find the biggest issue. So let's start from the crystal. In case of crystal, it could be either microscopic or there. So you have terrible modicity. How to go around it, how to process it. It could be microscopic order. Basically, you actually have good mosaic if somehow crystal doesn't diffract in spite of having 500 microns size in each direction. You may have actually very small crystal, and it's not, it's not clear what you should do next with this tiny, tiny crystal. You have also various types of pseudosymmetry and an isotropic diffraction. So let's start from crystal mosaic. Because these are last chance strategies, I'm not going to tell you that you should grow bigger, better crystal. Because obviously, if you could grow better crystal, we wouldn't have this conversation. So, but you can check if there is any chance for improvement by measuring base, uh, one or two images at room temperature for this type of crystals and entire protected crystals to check 
if the very high mosaicity is not related to the fire protection. Then you may decide not to optimize fire protection for various reasons. For example, many crystals, they are difficult to pick up, they grow in the each cubic phase and so on. However, at least you will know that the problem comes from freezing. So in case of the data processing, uh, there is obviously <laughs> approach which people already discussed. You are fixing mosaicity. Obviously, fixing mosaicity doesn't mean that you should pick up the default 0.3 degree mosaicity. You have mosaicity above 3.5 degree where most of the programs stop working well. You should fix it closer to the 3.5, not 0.3. However, even with fixing mosaicity during the next step during the crystal rotation, you may lose uh, alignment and basically things may crash. Therefore, it's also good to fix mosaicity during post-refinement or do not use post-refinement at all. What is post-refinement? During scaling, you actually use post-refinement to better refine some parameters. But this is last chance strategy. You already have terrible data. You just want to move forward. And anyway, you can solve structure. There was question if it works. This strategy works. Not always, but it works frequently enough that it is worth trying when you cannot get anything better. So then resolution is too low. What you can do with the resolution, which is too low? First of all, the first question is why it's too low? It could be that your problem is just the size of the crystal. And you can use this calculator from James Holton, which describes a very complex way, but still you can simulate if your crystal is sufficient. However, if this doesn't work, you obviously can go with the bigger crystals, but again, my point is that if you could easily go bigger crystals, you wouldn't need the last chance strategy. So we have to collect and map multiple crystals. I will briefly discuss it later. This is definitely not something which is standard, so nobody should use collecting and merging from multiple crystals as a default. If this is microscopic order in the crystal, you could obviously stabilize crystal better, but again, that's the experimental strategy. You may ask yourself a question if you don't want to stabilize crystal. Do you really need higher resolution? Because a lot of questions can be answered at the resolution about correction. So, if your question is requiring higher resolution data only to reach some level of the observation per parameter, maybe you should actually focus on optimizing lower resolution. And I will talk about it in a minute. So, coming back to the size of the crystal. In crystallography, size matters, and bigger is better. So here we have the volume of the crystal, and we see that the intensity of this H layer depends directly on the volume of the crystal in the beam. So every time you make the size <coughs> smaller than the crystal, you don't use the full diffraction potential, which is there. And obviously I understand, because microbeam is getting very popular, you may ask a question, but you know, I would like to use the microbeam. I will focus a bit about problems with microbeam in a minute. However, using the microbeam by itself is not the problem. You should use microbeam if your crystal is really tiny. If you have a crystal which has 5 microns, obviously you should use the beam, which is 5 microns, if you can. However, if you have a crystal which is 200 microns, then <coughs> use the 5 micron beam if you don't have to. So, why the, the microbeam can be problem? Because most of the methods which process data assume <coughs> that really rely on the average of value systematic effect. And when you have micro beam and you rotate the crystal, unfortunately, during the rotation, new parts of the crystal are coming in. These larger crystals were frozen. They weren't frozen perfectly, so various parts of the crystal have variability, which I call internal anomalous mode. And in fact, when you are rotating crystals, you generate a data, generate data set which has quite a lot of variability inside. And that variability obviously affects your anomaly signal. So you won't avoid it if you can. Sometimes you can't. So people are asking, but you know, when I use microbeam, spots have great shape. 
Here we see the spots which doesn't have any problem with data processing problem, which I'm using. I'm using a chair, but I actually know that they didn't have any problem with MBS because my collaborator used MBS first. And I have really this feeling that most of them handle them too. So, uh, what we see here? We see obviously that CRISPR was slightly crashed and there were also some satellites. And here we see that there was some very weird disorder. In the same time, I routinely forced my collaborators to use the beam of the size of the crystal, so this terrible diffraction was extending to about two inches. And software were, were able to pick up the peaks, and it was then relatively stable, not perfectly uh, processing the data. However, you may want to have slightly worse examples, so what you can do First of all, the default is this round spot. So integration happens in this kind of spots in Denso. You may change the shape to the linear shape, which will help a bit. But even then, during the processing, you know, various parts of the satellite crystals or disordered parts may uh, be more pronounced. So you may also want to fix distance and mosaic to be refined again. And again, this is not optimal strategy. This is not for your nice crystals. This is for crystals which look like that. But still, the first choice is beam of the size of the crystal, not micro beam. So why I have such <laughs> negative feelings about micro beam? Because micro basically there is no way around. You want to have the practice photons, the, the value of the equation is close to this then. If you make the beam smaller, smaller volume of the crystal is in the beam. You have to do something about it. You increase either exposure or, you know, focus in better so there is more photons in the crystal, which immediately generates radiation damage, which is more pronounced when the one for the larger beam. And why radiation damage is such, such a problem? Because it generates another type of non isomorphism. So during data collection, you actually have the mixture of two non isomorphisms, cryo protection induced one, and the one induced by the beam. And I will briefly describe radiation damage because I actually work on it a lot. So every time when you collect data per 10,000 photons, only five, about five, goes to the brass peaks. Most are stopped by the beam stock. However, each photon in cryo conditions generates generate 500 to 600 uh, ionizations. And this ionization, this so-called ogre electrons, are going happily through your protein, generating other damage. Type of the damage called tunneling is temperature independent. So unfortunately, even in cryo temperatures, you will have uh, changes, and these changes will be specific to some parts of the structure. Obviously, it means that each structure will have different pattern of the specific changes. So, this is why we model this as a two-component model. So there is this overall decay, intensity per inch goes down. And this model overall decay was present in the processing programs from the beginning, because in 60s, people noticed that if you expose Rita, intensity is going down for the reflections. However, specific change described, localized change, are really more visible in cryo structures because in temperature, room temperature, you, must, you have much faster radiation damage, but many of these reactions diffuse because the combination happens. So localized changes and sometimes crystal lattice changes uh, are specific for the cryoprotected crystals, and these are changes which generate from isomorphism, which affect obviously phasing. So how, what I mean by crystal lattice changes? For some crystals, during the exposure to X-ray, uh, what is generated in the combination is hydrogen, gas hydrogen, and it accumulates in specific places and leads to the collapse of the light. This is a rare effect, but I'm pretty sure that it, per, I would say rare means once per 200 data sets. So how do I identify radiation damage? First, I will show the decay. Decay is actually identified very well by so-called overall de facto increase. In some places, it is shown 
I think in other programs it could go in opposite direction. However, the point is that you have side line if the beam size is larger than the uh, crystal. And one unit is pretty close to the one megahertz. So actually, this is pretty good proxy for the dose. Uh, plus is good too. However, here you literally measure all the photons which hit the crystal. And I would say that for most of the crest, uh, facing projects, you want to have the factor increase around 10 to 20. So actually what Raj picked up as an optimal dose was pretty close to what I would pick up as an optimal dose for the same. However, it is very difficult to keep the dose in this range because for most of the projects which I see, the B factor increases frequently in the range of 20, 30, 40. I saw also 100 or 200 or some searches. This was, by the way, collected at home dose. You are reaching 10 to 20 megagrays in seconds uh, at Argon. However, this was the overall decay, the one which is very well corrected. The non isomorphism is not very well corrected, the specific damage, and it shows itself during scaling as the smile, or in this case it was more like V letter. You see also increase of the chi square if you consider resolution change of intensity in the lower resolution. And then if you check how the chi-square behaves in the intensity ranges, you see for medium resolution, it's very characteristic bump. So uh, this is the systematic effect, and it's not really multiplicative. So we introduce corrections which uh, we discussed, so you can just press the button. The problem with these corrections is that they rely on the assumption that those is proportional to the frame number. So more frames, larger the dose. But obviously, if you collect multiple crystals, by the way, you could see that they correct very well. Here we can, after corrections, we can see very clearly as it will be rejected. So, they rely on the assumption that frame number correlates with the dose. However, this is not good assumption if you collect inverse beam, if you collect data from multiple crystals. And you still want to use these corrections because they really are critical for the anomalous signal determination. So for that, you need the special macro, which is introduced during scaling in the HL 2000. And it calls for radiation dose type A means type of the unknown isomorphism. And then you have the expression B factor. You just write this. B factor means that the program will take changes of the B factor when uh, approximating the dose. Uh, and as I said, it is very useful in every situation when you are dealing with non-continuous data collection. <coughs> this is the third part which I mentioned, the explosion. So you had just 180 degree, actually a bit more, very nice data collection, and you see that it was very nice data collection, but not for a long time. Something was happening around 150, we see suddenly increasing mosaicity. And by the way, I can center crystal crystal was found at the beginning. So this is the last chance strategy. Actually, by the first, it's good to have good completeness, but if you cannot have good completeness and you have some signal, you are much better off cutting a bit of the data. And unfortunately, this is error central. So you have to find out how much you should cut to get something. This structure was, by the way, very nicely solved after the streaming. Obviously, the resolution is much better than the resolution which you are dealing with, but with the full data set, which includes this very weird behavior, obviously, it wasn't so great solution. And here we have also, basically, this data set was still affected even after trimming. So the next type of the problems are the problems related to the crystal symmetry issues. So <coughs> the question is, because I see this very often, people try to go to the lower symmetry. This is really not a good idea. Artificial decreasing the symmetry does not uh, give you any additional information. 
you may like some numbers better, but you will not get the solution. Uh, basically, you will not solve your problem by decreasing the space, uh, the point, the space group or point group in any play during uh, data processing or solving structure. So, in very rare cases, there is one to perform that operation, but it's at the end. Let's say that there are actually quite famous HIV protein structures where the drug is located on the uh, six-fold uh, axis, and the space group is 6 to 2, and it's very really, you have two conformations. For simply, just for refinement purposes, they use the P6. Uh, one of the P6 uh, space groups to handle this because but this is at the end. In fact, there is good to cheat a bit and go to the higher symmetry in few specific cases. So sometimes you have very high translation of the symmetry, which makes heavy such difficult because heavy such programs rely on the assumption that the distribution of information in the asymmetric unit has to random. Obviously, if you have such strong non-origin patterns on peaks, that's not really good assumption. So you can artificially impose higher symmetry, and usually it actually, in, at least in few cases, it led to the structure solution. And you may wonder what will happen to your uh, model. Actually, your model will have higher disorder, but this disorder will be pretty much proportional to the uh, how much the structure differs. And usually in such cases, this will be not big enough factor to justify, at least at the point of the data processing, dealing with translational pseudosymmetry. The same is true for rotational symmetry. Simply, uh, you see that during our merging, that going to the high symmetry gives you slightly more statistics, but for the heavy atom search, it may be actually quite viable strategy. So now I will move at the end really to the fact to the problems which you encounter during the phasing process. So one of the things which everybody should ask is yourself is why do we need higher resolution? So obviously sometimes you have questions which require higher resolution. But frequently, you want to have higher resolution because you want to have enough parameters, observations per parameters, which you are going to use in the process. And the truth is that many questions are perfectly well answered at resolutions 3.5 or 4. 5.5 is probably stretch. So, <laughs> but what I'm simply saying is that if you don't need the higher resolution and you have problem with structure solution, Maybe you should basically consider reading the old papers. So in 1975, Wayne Hendrickson solved structure, and his figure of merit was 0 0.9. Uh, so at this time, there was no basic modification. With time, figure of merit started decreasing. Why? Obviously, why it was possible that he, without any computers, with, okay, there were computers, but <laughs> not very fast, how it was possible that he could solve the task? He had excellent figure of merit, and every page he done observation. So for each HKL, he had not only uh, intensity, he had also phase. So suddenly, he had, he had twice as many observations. Then methods developed, and he went with the lower and lower starting figure of merit, which is good. However, if you are in a situation with, where you cannot really afford this or you cannot solve the structure for various reasons, maybe you should consider basically the old methods and increasing the number of observations per parameter using this historical approach, which would be actually to use heavy atom derivatives not for sub or mass, but for the uh, multiple isomorphous replacement. And if you are considering it, there are two important things to remember. In this context, selenomeric, which gives you 5% of signal for average protein, will not be your final derivative, because it's not enough. It's excellent for register, because, you know, at you may need validation. 
You should start from the clusters, tungstate, tantalum, and traditional heavy atoms like mercury. So tungstate and tantalum, what is important to remember, has internal structure which causes them to be very good under some resolution, then you have basically the deep and they recover and two ancients or much a bit longer. So you don't have two ancients. Therefore, for time state, your resolution for the phase is supposed to be about seven ancients. This is where you look for heavy atoms, even if you see signal actually without the signal to higher resolution. For tantalum, you can use about five ancients. What you shouldn't use? Actually, both salts with rubidium and Halides may not be the best choice in such cases because they will attach in multiple places with variable occupancy. These are not good choices for low resolution data. And they will increase your absorption in the crystal, which means the radiation damage will go faster. So, why am I trying to convince you to do this? Because right now we are working on four cases, A, B, C, D. All of them are having resolution between 3.5 to 4. And their N, which I describe the number of observations per parameter, excluding NCS, is between 1.7 and 2.7. This one I will present on the next slide. This one is really painful. I know that we will solve it. Uh, this is definitely not a pleasant experience. So, each of these cases were, were actually solved by multiple isomorphic replacements. And there is obviously clear correlation with difficulty. So, if you cannot increase your number of uh, observations per parameter uh, in any other way than MIR, you just have to do MIR. So this is the structure of the result accidentally. Basically, there's this contamination in the test. They optimize the purification for the red protein with binding, got the crystals, we solved it, and then this binding in protein really didn't behave like it's supposed to. For example, it was much larger than expected. So it turned out that it was actually the uh, cytochrome BC complex which we kind of solved the novel because we didn't know what it is. And after solving it, out, it turned out that our model is actually better than the one we did, so we will probably the process. <coughs> Not that it's priority right now, but... So, to summarize, basically, as I said, the whole point of the collecting data from most people is actually getting the structure. So when you are going forward, you always have to make compromises, and I will pretty much always focus on the worst possible problem and then move forward without over-optimizing small issues. Because the small issues may be important, but no, maybe not. Because I already thanked all the people before, so that's the end, and now I can answer questions. And by the way, Many of you with difficult projects really need the people who can modify software for you. So during this session with the developers, you should actually talk to them because one of the ways to, you know, advance is to actually force them to <laughs> prefer custom version for you.